My name is Sean McKelvey. I am the CEO for the Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm a pharmacist by profession and for the last five years I've specialized in helping people to reduce or eliminate the need for medic medication for chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes. My talk today is on therapeutic nutrition and why we consider this to be a team sport. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, the IPTN does not accept any funding from for-profit companies and in terms of dietary preferences uh, I am an omnivore. I do follow a low-sugar, low-starch dietary approach. I do incorporate time-restricted eating as well as I do ketogenic cycles throughout the year. Learning objectives. This is all about uh, developing teamwork within the therapeutic nutrition context. context. So I'm going to cover uh, how we see the opportunity for healthcare professionals to work more effectively as a team. In terms of setting the stage, the IPTN is a not-for-profit, uh, so it's important that you recognize that. Um, we're also diet agnostic, uh, so we don't actually have a specific preference. We believe it should be individualized, but the focus needs to be on clinical outcomes. And really what we're trying to do is promote this interdisciplinary team-based approach uh, so that ultimately we can get the message out that therapeutic nutrition requires uh, clinical oversight by healthcare professionals who actually know what they need to be doing in order to be able to prevent predictable adverse events. Uh, especially when, it, when you're talking about medications, some of the dietary approaches that can be used, such as very low carbohydrate diets or even very low calorie diets or intermittent fasting or time restricted eating can have a profound impact on medications and it's important that all healthcare professionals are aware of this. Um, and really it needs to be individualized as well to the person's preferences, so their likes and dislikes, their cultural influences, their religious influences, all the things that are key to an individual and as to whether or not they're going to be sustainable in that type of uh, dietary approach. Uh, and the good news is, is that there are a number of evidence-based approaches now uh, within the therapeutic nu nutrition umbrella, which is going to give patients options and hope and opportunities for the future. So the IPTN vision is basically just to, to focus on a food first approach. It's not about getting rid of pharmaceuticals. It's about appropriate utilization after a food first approach has been tried. Our mission is to prepare healthcare professionals to safely prescribe therapeutic nutrition. And we're focusing on four st strategic areas. Uh, so research, uh, doing multidisciplinary research, which I'll talk on a little bit later. Uh, we're building communities of interest. So we have an online community of over 1,800 healthcare professionals. Uh, we train healthcare professionals. So I've been training pharmacists for about four and a half years. Uh, we're now in the process of just finalizing a, a a competency-based physician program, and we'll be rolling out uh, programs for dietitians and nurses and other healthcare professionals over time. We're also building up support tools, so tools and resources, as well as working with technology providers to help scale the implementation of therapeutic nutrition uh, as it becomes more uh, recognized as a uh, legitimate part of the standard of care. Um, our definition of, of therapeutic nutrition, it's not about prevention, it's actually about treating an underlying metabolic dysfunction. So it's treating medical conditions and it's helping to either manage or even achieve remission in some cases. Um, so it's, it's different than the prevention, as I said. You can think of it kind of like um, an antibiotic. Uh, so an antibiotic that has a beginning and an end. Uh, the intent is not to have that person on an antibiotic for the rest of their life. The, in, the intent is to treat the underlying infection and then um, put that person into a maintenance mode to prevent that infection from reoccurring. We would like to see the same thing within the therapeutic nutrition world uh, so that ultimately we have a monitoring and maintenance process and a relapse management strategy to ensure that uh, these metabolic dysfunctions do not return. And the main reason that we feel that therapeutic nutrition is needed is because of the global overnutrition issue that we're dealing with. A hundred years ago, it was undernutrition. Now we're dealing with global overnutrition, where in the case of Canada, 63% of the population has obesity or is overweight. Um, in the US, it's even worse. And so we have this massive problem, but it's really only the tip of an iceberg that is much larger. And the real problem is about metabolic health. And so when we look at the, the, um, the studies that have been done looking at metabolic health within the US population, roughly only 12% of the US population is considered to be optimally metabolically healthy. 
So you can see what the parameters are on the side there, the criteria related to waist cir circumference and blood pressure and uh, hemoglobin A1C and those sorts of things. But the scary part is that when you look down at the bottom, two thirds of the normal weight uh, individuals in the population are not optimally healthy. We've always thought that if you keep your weight normal, you're going to be healthy. Uh, that is not necessarily the case. And so the problem that we're dealing with is we've got potentially in this, the US up to 300 million people who are not optimally healthy. They are on that continuum of metabolic dysfunction. And we have only about a million primary care providers to be able to address all of these issues that are going to be um, a consequence of that underlying metabolic uh, issue. And so the progression to development of these chronic conditions is going to just continue to advance. So we believe that the only way that we're gonna be able to take this on is through the use of teamwork, where healthcare professionals are working together to address this problem. The contextual factors um, that we look at First off, there is a global need to reverse the epidemic of chronic diseases that are just threatening to overwhelm the entire system. Um, we see that people now are starting to get interested in these food first approaches. They don't want to be taking the medications that their, uh, their parents and grandparents have been taking. And so there's an opportunity there. And when we combine that with the advances that have happened with technology over the last number of years, especially when we look at digital therapeutics, as well as the cognitive behavioral th um, therapies, there's some incredible opportunities to scale some of these interventions. And we know that primary care providers are looking for interventions that improve outcomes as well as their professional satisfaction. They're tired of the same old process that just keeps um, spitting out more and more sick people. And so we're now at a point where what we really are looking for is trusted and credible resources for healthcare professionals so that they can support the self-care of those individuals who are interested in uh, utilizing therapeutic nutrition as part of their management plan. And the good news is that we've actually known for almost 20 years that there is a model out there that actually shows how we can incorporate the health system within a community infrastructure and support patients through a foundation of, of interaction between a prepared proactive team and an informed and activated patient. So there's systems that already are there and we have identified that this is how we should be doing chronic care. Now it's a matter of applying it within the therapeutic nutrition context and making sure that healthcare professionals are prepared and that patients have a recognition that things like diabetes remission are now possible. So we know that remission is going to be a big driver for change. As soon as people start to recognize this within the community, it is gonna be taking off like crazy. The problem is, is that we've got patients who are interested in doing this. We've got people who are excited about the potential of achieving remission, but we have a healthcare system that currently is not prepared to help support and manage the implications of some of the changes that may be necessary. So we've got this credibility crisis that I refer to it, where uh, the public is going in and asking for remission and the providers are just completely unaware that remission is even a possibility. So the good news is, is the guidelines are catching up, but the problem is, is that we don't have enough care providers who understand the safety implications, particularly for very low calorie or very low carbohydrate diets. And especially when you incorporate things like intermittent fasting and you have multiple medications involved, particularly those ones for diabetes, it's a recipe for disaster. So we need to prepare those healthcare professionals to deal with this real issue that is developing as we go along. And it, we want everyone to have hope. We want everyone to have opportunity to implement these dietary approaches. We just have to do it safely. And in terms of sustainability, as I mentioned, we have got a massive problem. It's a tidal wave of chronic diseases that we have to deal with. And if we don't deal with it now, we're not going to be able to afford our health system in the future. And we really hope that that healthcare professionals will look at adopting these types of therapeutic nutrition options because when they do, they have incredible professional satisfaction. They, they are, um, I've had more people crying on my shoulder in the last five years than I ever did in the 20 years previously as a pharmacist. So the thing that we have to recognize though is that change doesn't happen overnight. Change is a process and it involves many stages. So from innovation all the way to those folks that are the laggards or the real skeptics who are really not going to be supportive of any kind of change, no matter what that change is. 
The key thing is that we are actually at an early part here. So we're in the early adopter stage. So if we want to deal with that large chasm that exists between the early adopters and the early majority, which is about actually achieving scale and about getting the, the, uh, the approaches of therapeutic nutrition integrated into the normal process of, of uh, physician clinical practice, we have to find a way to cross that chasm. And this is where we need to start building bridges as opposed to shooting at those folks who have, have rightfully, they have skepticism because this is a new emerging area of practice. And so they're still not sure, but we have to create bridges. We have to work with and support and help people understand, especially that early majority that, boy, this is an opportunity for every healthcare professional. So the public has a role, but especially the healthcare professionals have a role to make sure that we are not shooting ourselves in the foot by actually creating a, a conflict and a and a um an ongoing um argument with those people who actually have questions about the evidence and are are seriously interested and I'll come back to this a little bit later so I want to just define or, or differentiate between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary so multidisciplinary is basically about independent uh, contributions to patient care. So using expertise and scope of, a, of an individual practice. Whereas interdisciplinary is much more about teamwork and working together um, within the, the context of providing optimal care. So the team is going to be solving problems um, and it's going to be working together and each member of the team will contribute to the knowledge and skills of the entire team. Uh, so it's quite different. It's not about just a referral process. It's about an integration process. So why is this important? We, we need to improve access to care and interdisciplinary teams do that. You don't have a single uh, point of, of, uh, of interaction within the health system. You actually have multiple points of connection. It aligns very well with the relational based uh, person centered care, uh, which is the, the foundation of our healthcare system as we move forward. It, re it results in improved outcomes and as well, it utilizes the expertise and knowledge and skills of multiple disciplines and it capitalizes on the overlapping scope that each of the individual providers has. No one covers everything and can be an expert in all areas. So we need to capitalize on those, those expertises that exist. And we know it's going to be cost effective and because it's community based, it makes it really adaptable and we can kind of incorporate whatever resources and circumstances exist within an existing practice. But it's also very suited for continuity of care and a lot of the work that's being done on quality improvement. Especially in the UK, there's been a ton of work on quality improvement. So teamwork is a core aspect of it. And it starts with a shared purpose where everyone really understands their role and they're leading change. They're leading change within their, co um, with their colleagues. They're leading change within their practice. And it's about making sure that we get the information out to all the providers and that we provide them with the tools and the resources that they need in order to be effective. Um, and to improve their efficiency. And we need to plan this out so that the implementation is being done and measured on an ongoing basis so that then we can share the successes as we move along because positive results result in a virtuous cycle that ultimately leads to systemic change. And when we look at, and this is going to look a little complex, but when we look at what interdisciplinary care is all about, it's, it's not simple. It requires work, but I think the key thing here is that it starts with where you are in terms of your setting. So if you are in a hospital or a, a clinic, you're going to have a completely different approach to doing this. But the bottom line is it starts with a family or patient oriented approach within the community. And really what the intent here is to to clarify roles so everyone knows what their role is within that particular team. Make sure that you, you map out the team dynamics. How is communication going to occur and, and how will the information be shared across the team? Um, you deal with conflict. So instead of running away from conflict, we, conflict, we have to address it, identifying the overlapping in scope and making sure that each person has a very clear understanding of where they fit. And ultimately it requires leadership. And if we do this right, it fits incredibly well within this context of quality improvement. 
So we believe that therapeutic nutrition is actually the ideal model for interdisciplinary care. We have mapped out a nutrition, uh, a therapeutic nutrition responsibility matrix, which has a number of different components. And this is, this has a lot of different pieces, as you can see. So there's all the different providers on the top and each um, possible option in terms of the responsibilities or accountabilities. We've created this so that it can actually be adaptable to the individual practice that is out there. So there are 10 specific steps that we've identified in terms of tax, uh, tasks that need to be done in order to support uh, a patient who is choosing therapeutic nutrition as an option. Depending upon the, the setting that you are involved in, this could look completely different. Okay. And the nice thing is, is it's highly adaptable. It's principle based. It's not prescriptive. We're not telling people that you have to do it a certain way. It provides you an opportunity to discuss within your team who is going to be doing what task so that we can free up the other providers to do other things. So it leverages scope of practice and it improves access um, and efficiencies. So the nice thing is, is that we can also incorporate uh, geographically uh, distributed uh, providers. So if you don't happen to have a team that is within your clinic, um, maybe you can tap into a team that is distributed within your community. So you're looking for pharmacists and, and dietitians and nurses who are within your, your community who have a similar interest as you. Um, you can also do virtual. So maybe you don't have someone within your community. There's many providers now who are providing uh, services virtually. Um, so you can communicate with them, set up that arrangement, and then make sure that patients have access to that virtual care. And you can also outsource. So there's companies now that are providing complete diabetes reversal and remission services. This is where the future is going to be, is integrating these different models depending upon what is available within your community. So it's always adaptable. And here's an example of a clinic where you have a physician, a nurse, and a health coach that are working together. So you can build the team based on what's available to you. And then you allocate the specific tasks depending upon what the uh, what is available in terms of the skill sets and, and knowledge base. Some clinics are even now starting to incorporate patient coaches. So these are patients who are not getting all of the, the medical information. So they don't have the complete information about them, the medical history, but they're actually acting as coaches and being there to support patients and follow up and to, to do the behind the scenes work that often gets missed and is one of the reasons why patients will fall through the, the cracks. So we're looking at how we can utilize these local services, but also how we can augment it virtually. Um, and ultimately, depending upon how complex a patient is, you may be able to tap into outsource uh, an outsource provider as well. So we've got some examples here of, of when you can include a teammate. So if you're a physician uh, or if you are a nurse and you are wondering when would it be appropriate to include a dietitian or when would it be appropriate to include a pharmacist, we've put together and this has been developed uh, as a multidisciplinary type of, of, uh, of process where we've talk to dietitians, we've talked to pharmacists, and we put together this approach where you can look at those things that are recommended, those things are feasible, and those things, those times where it's not required. So if you have a highly motivated individual that is literate in terms of the food, as well as understanding the reading and writing and all the things that are typical to the types of people that are interested in, in this topic area, well, obviously they're not going to require the same degree of support as someone who has a much more complex history, who has, um, you know, body image issues or has a history of disordered eating. Similarly, when you're looking at a pharmacist, if you require very close monitoring, the pharmacist is a great, um, professional to add on to the team, um, but you're not going to necessarily require them for other types of medication. So it's about utilizing a team effectively based on the scope and skills that are required. So the challenges are we have lack of awareness. Um, so we have uh, people just aren't aware that remission is possible. We also have lack of knowledge and competency to provide therapeutic nutrition, and especially when it comes to uh, the safety aspect. Um, we have lack of international standards and best practices in this area. Um, we know that research is only starting to catch up to the practice that has been going on in many cases for up to 10 years. And the real challenge that we look at is that funding for interdisciplinary collaboration and care is really lacking. And so that helps to slow down the process and make it even more difficult to do it. 
We also recognize that there are different degrees of readiness amongst healthcare professionals. So you saw that change diagram, which shows that there are a number of different groups. And we might find that certain groups are especially difficult to work with because of the fact that they're more on the skeptical side. But that shouldn't stop us from attempting to work with them. And so I want to really focus on what we can do to, to address that. I refer to it as the rubber band effect. So practice change is actually tough. It's very difficult. And when you are working with colleagues to try and get them to change, I like to equate it to a rubber band where you're applying attention to try and get them to move in moving in your direction. But this virtual rubber band is, is very, um, finicky in that if it's thin, it will stretch quickly and it could break. If it's thicker, but you really can't get a good hold on things, maybe you're not going to be able to move them in the direction you want. So the nice thing is that friendships, um, and as well, if you, if you have a, a degree of authority, so if you're a specialist in a particular area, that creates a, a greater degree of thickness and people are more willing to move when they see that, okay, you, you, you're a legitimate person, you're credible, and you're talking about this. However, if you have an immovable object and you put it, a rubber band on that immovable object and try pulling, eventually it's just going to snap and you're the only person who's going to get hurt in that process. So the rubber band is a really important concept in terms of understanding practice change. So be prepared. Um, you've probably already had these discussions. You're excited. You, you want to get up on the mountain and talk about how uh, these approaches have helped you, how they're helping your patients. But the problem is, is that not, not everyone is receptive. In fact, a lot of people are extremely skeptical. And so they will come up with a lot of reasons why they can't actually um, do this in their practice. That is very normal. And don't be discouraged. Be prepared. When you're approaching a colleague or even a potential teammate, it's really important that you park your passions at the door. The last thing you want to do is come in all excited and bouncing up and down and uh, you find out that this, this person actually is very much against what it is that you're proposing. So you have to remind yourself that you are an ambassador and diplomats, they end wars. They don't start wars. So you don't want to create a conflict. What you want to do is have a respectful discussion and begin the process of practice change. So you can assess their readiness by asking questions. So for example, um, you can say research is showing that remission of type 2 diabetes is now possible. Um, what are you telling your patients who ask you about remission? Um, that's a great way for them, A, to become aware that remission is now possible if they didn't know, but it also puts them on the spot to address the fact that, okay, well, I'm either telling them about remission or I am denying them information about remission. And so that becomes a really important uh, conversation. And it's also super important, especially when we now have guidelines which are helping to support some of the approaches that we are looking to see more implemented. So the changes to the guidelines, if the, if you have that discussion with a colleague, it's a great way to get things started. And then the, the final one is, is really about the safety implications. So talking about, hey, medications have to be reduced, reduced really quickly in some cases. You know, what are you doing in your practice to address this safety issue? It really establishes a great kind of starting point for conversations as you move forward. And, you know, this avoids the immediate conflict as well. And that's really what you're trying to do here is you're trying to, to uh, extend that olive branch to begin a discussion and to talk about this from a patient focused perspective, because patients are going to do these diets whether we support them or not. So our job is to make sure that we can safely address those issues and prevent predictable adverse events. And then, as I said before, if you can't find the, the resources locally, look for uh, virtual providers that are licensed within your state so that you can actually work with those uh, providers to ensure access for your patients. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the IPTN and some of the, the cool work that we've been doing uh, to help address some of these issues and, and give more information and evidence for providers to be able to incorporate therapeutic nutrition into their practice. I want to start with our feasibility study that we're doing with the University of British Columbia, which was launched in January. Um, we're using a Canadianized Grow Health app. So Grow Health is the low carb program from the UK, uh, and it's been brought into Canada, has been Canadianized, 
It's, it's a personalized online 12 week program. It's being used in 10 practices across the, uh, the country. And the whole idea here is we want to make it as easy to prescribe therapeutic nutrition as it is to prescribe metformin. If we can make it simple for physicians, um, so that whether it's a fee for service model or it's a, uh, it's a capitation model or a salary type model, if we can make it simple, we know that adoption will be there. The great thing is that it involves an entire uh, lifestyle intervention. So there's the nutritional approach, um, there's sleep, there's exercise and well-being. So it covers the behavioral change aspects that are really key. So I'm really excited where this project could go in the future. We're also doing needs assessments with dietitians. So we wanted to assess the knowledge, understanding, comfort level, uh, perception of competency of Canadian dietitians so that we could really understand what the needs are. What can we do to help dietitians to prepare them for this new paradigm? Um, and why did we just go for carbohydrate restriction? Well, patient safety is the number one issue. Right now, very few providers understand the, the profound impact that these dietary interventions can have on medications. And we want the, the healthcare professionals, especially dietitians, to understand that so that they're prepared. Um, we wanted to also do it because dietitians were asking us about it. They were asking about us to provide the tools and resources and training. And we also saw all the recent changes in the international guidelines. So uh, the ADA standards of care um, soon in Canada, the, the uh, Diabetes Canada will be coming on, up with their position statement on carbohydrate restriction. So we're, we're seeing a lot of different changes that are happening. So uh, dietitians have not been trained in this. Therefore, we need to be there to support them and, and to help them to become uh, proficient in this new area of practice. And we also did it to limit survey length. So what's interesting is that based on a couple hundred uh, dietitian responses, the, the top issues are around lack of knowledge, not feeling competent about implementing carb restriction, and not actually having trained. So 50% of the dietitians feel this. So it's not about never wanting to do this. They're not in the laggard stage. They're in that sort of early adopter um, and sort of uh, uh, the next majority group. So the folks that are, are interested, they want to learn more about this, but right now there just isn't good information out there. So they don't have trusted content. Um, they don't have the supports. The diabetes education programs don't uh, support this. So there's interest but we need to get across and, and work with them. And this is the key thing. Dietitians are going to be an incredibly important resource as we move into the larger implementation of therapeutic nutrition. We have to reach out, we have to work with them, we have to support them. And I know that a lot of people have negative, um, uh, and have had negative responses in the past. We have to work past that. We have to continue to explore the opportunity to work with dietitians. They are amazing. I have to tell you, some of the best providers that I've worked with are dietitians. And so we have to give them that chance. We have to, um, we have to use that olive branch. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our physician trial because I mentioned earlier that I've specialized in this area and, and we did a trial started in 2017 um, looking at if pharmacists utilized a, uh, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, this was a commercially available one, could we eliminate the need for glucose lowering medications and could we improve blood glucose? And at the time there wasn't a lot of uh, research out that we could reverse or achieve remission. So this was kind of a, a novel way for us to explore the role of community pharmacists. And that's the key here. It's community pharmacists to see if they could help support uh, the deprescribing safely in the community type practice. So the study was a 12 week study and we had 98 uh, participants that were in the therapeutic nutrition group. It was a randomized control trial. So, uh, this was, uh, we, we didn't pick and choose the, the best, uh, patients. We randomly selected them based on their interest in, uh, re the ability to potentially reduce or eliminate medications. So you can see here the hypoglycemic reductions are quite dramatic. So we, we call this the medication cliff. And you can see that most of the changes are actually occurring before any significant weight loss. So it's a lot of the, the people think that, oh, we have to wait until all the weight loss occurs. Well, actually, no. Um, we can see significant weight loss prior to, uh, or sorry, significant medication reductions prior to any weight loss. So that is really, really key as we move along. Plus you can see the darker lines indicate the drugs that are most likely to cause hypoglycemia. So it's really important that those drugs are being monitored and, uh, uh, and watched for. 
Okay, so hemoglobin A1C, so even with all of these massive reductions in medications, we saw a significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C. Um, so a greater than 1.6% reduction in hemoglobin A1C over that 12-week period. Um, so dramatic changes and dramatic improvements. So obviously there's a huge opportunity. Again, you may not have thought of a pharmacist as being interested, uh, but we had, we asked 13 pharmacies to participate. All 13 pharmacies wanted to, only 12 of the 13 actually were able to. So these were community pharmacists in community practice. We just gave them the training and the support and the tools that they needed to be successful. And now things are really starting to take off. So why is this all important? I've mentioned medication safety numerous times. There can be dramatic impact on blood glucose and blood pressure. We need to be aware of that. Every healthcare professional needs to be uh, informed and in a position to be able to support, support patients in the choices that they are making. We also cl see clinical opportunities where healthcare professionals are going to specialize in this particular area, supporting patients that are on very complex uh, diabetes management regimens and are able to actually help them reduce or eliminate many of the medications that they're taking. And we're also seeing specialty practices starting to pop up in Canada um, where pharmacies are specializing on these diabetes remission uh, approaches and they're implementing an, an approach that's not only about just getting people off of medications, but they're establishing those pharmacies as ongoing monitoring, maintenance, and relapse management centers. So they will be supporting the physician as well as the dietitians in the needs that they have in order to support the community, uh, the community health. So there's huge opportunities for the teamwork. Um, and again, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be all under the same roof. Reach out and connect with healthcare professionals within your community. Make them aware that these types of training opportunities exist and healthcare professionals will be able to work much more effectively as a team than independently. So I wanted to also just tell you very quickly about the other IPTN initiatives. So I mentioned an online community. We have over 1,800 members already. Um, these are healthcare professionals that have an interest in therapeutic nutrition. I want to see this to be tens of thousands of healthcare professionals around the world. So please feel free to join our community. Um, it's therapeuticnutrition.org org slash join. Um, we would love to see more healthcare professionals from the US and, and other countries around the world. We do a, front, a free monthly CME. So this is an accredited uh, webinar from uh, UBC Continuing Professional Development. And uh, we do a, a number of different topics. So each month is a different topic uh, from non-alcoholic fatty liver to information about insulin, which is happening next week, or information on even um, developing uh, uh, whole food plant-based keto diets, um, those types of things. There's lots of really interesting information for providers um, that they can learn firsthand. Um, we're, as I mentioned, we're finalizing a competency-based uh, education program for health professionals and that will be later this year. We're also building a parallel student engagement strategy so that we can start working with students while they're still in university. Help us get curriculum into the formal curriculum but in the meantime we can work with them on a parallel basis. Uh, we've done some work with Cork University in Ireland and we're just building out a curriculum or at least we'll be working on building out a curriculum in the coming months here so that we can start doing formalized engagements of students um, across universities in the UK, in the US, and in Canada. Um, well, I've also been doing a lot of lecturing uh, at universities as well as conferences on therapeutic nutrition and the particularly as it relates to diabetes remission and medication safety because these are going to be critical factors as we move forward. I've also been working with pharmacy groups across Canada to set up these community-based diabetes remission centers. Uh, so huge opportunities to uh, make people aware that this is an op uh, opportunity that's available to them. Uh, and we are hosting Canada's first therapeutic nutrition conference for health professionals. Uh, because of the current uh, crisis that is occurring related to the, the uh, coronavirus, uh, it's probably going to be delayed until next spring. Uh, we did actually have it for October of this year, but we're probably going to delay it. So just pay attention at the bottom there, uh, the Nutrition 2020 on the UBC CPD site. It will update on when the conference is going to be held. So quick wrap up. 
Um, overnutrition is a recognized driver of chronic disease. It's, it's very clear. And, and obesity is only one of the factors. As I mentioned, metabolic health is the much more important underlying issue. We now know that remission is possible and that it should be provided as an option for all patients. Um, we know that therapeutic nutrition is a really exciting opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration and for healthcare professionals to be working together to really provide the greatest options for patients. It requires a, a team approach to prevent those predictable and preventable medication-related adverse events that I mentioned around medication safety. And everyone has a role to play um, in terms of the leadership and, and being able to get this uh, practice out there. And it really starts with just a simple conversation. And talk to your friends, talk to your colleagues, talk to the people that, uh, uh, even if you're, you're part of the public, go in and start talking to healthcare professionals about diabetes remission and, and uh, the opportunities for patients to be able to do it. And again, do it respectfully, understanding that not everyone is at that point in the readiness scale to be able to implement these types of practices. And you have to respect the rubber band. So if you're going to ask people to change, you have to be careful about how quickly you are asking them to change. They will need time and they will need support. And that will be your job. You are a, an ambassador for this movement and you need to be in a position to be able to support them. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. There's my contact information. If you want more information, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful conference and uh, bye for now.